Hey guys, this video is sponsored by ExpressVPN, so make sure to stick around at the end of the video to find out how you can get three months for free on your next order. We've been pretty spoiled this year as far as indie games go, with the release of titles like Dredge, Dave the Diver, and then FPS games like Bolt Gun and Amnesia the Bunker. And now there's another game to add to the ranks with My Friendly Neighborhood, a survival horror first-person shooter developed by Evan and John Szymanski, brothers of Dave Szymanski, another game dev famously known for creating Dusk, Iron Lung, and also being contrarian on Twitter just for the sake of it. He's right, you know. And if the fact that I've beaten My Friendly Neighborhood three times now isn't any kind of giveaway, well, just let me say outright here that, yeah, I really like this game. To the point that it might be one of my favorites of the entire year, and how this thing has only been developed by two people is just astounding. Wow, you're so courageous and stuff. Story set in the 1990s, and you're playing as a repairman named Gordon, sent to the rundown and abandoned studio lot for an old kids series that's been shut down since the 80s called My Friendly Neighborhood. Turns out that one night the show just started broadcasting again at random, so Gordon's been tasked with heading in and switching off the antenna to stop the whole thing from being televised. Disable the antenna? Only he finds the studio still very much teeming with life as he's greeted by an odd sock puppet named Ricky. Uh. Hello. And yeah, the irony of a game about a failing mascot brand coming back to life at a time when it feels like every second horror game has a mascot theme to it is not lost on me. How embarrassing. Because for some reason these puppets are now walking around the studio trying to relive their glory days or something when they were still popular and relevant, and they're none too happy about Gordon trying to get them off the airwaves. You need a Either way though, Gordon still has a job to do, as it turns out he's on thin ice with his employers after a couple of piss-weak performances in the past, so he's got no choice here but to head on in and find out what's happening. Okay Gordon, what's next? All up, there's five main areas of the studio. You've got the stage, the sewers, the offices, the gardens, and then the main tower where the antenna is. And getting to the top of that tower is like a four or five hour long journey where a bunch of these hug-happy puppets are going to try to stop you at every turn. <laughs> Now I've seen My Friendly Neighborhood described as Resident Evil meets Sesame Street, and honestly that's probably the best way to sum the whole thing up. Definitely wears its influences on its sleeves when it comes to the RE series, and fans of those games are going to see some pretty striking similarities. For starters, you can kind of look at that opening area of the studio as like the lobby in the Spencer Mansion. Okay. I'll try the door on the opposite side. With it breaking off into all these separate areas from that point on. You've got simple things like save rooms with item boxes and a whole bunch of inventory management. Your health is displayed as either healthy, caution, or in danger. There's door keys with specific shapes, there's a crank, there's bolt cutters, and save tokens which more or less work like ink ribbons. I mean, all that's missing is green herbs and first aid spray. When an item no longer has a use, you can discard it from your inventory to save space. And you've also got plenty of backtracking from area to area as you find new items and unlock shortcuts to make that whole process a lot quicker. There's a sequence where you need to drain a bathtub to get an item at the bottom. There's another one that requires fuses being placed in a specific order. And then another puzzle where you need to interact with paintings in an art gallery in a very specific order too. The second half of the game even has you going through a garden area and a shed, avoiding dogs, and even powering up an elevator with a battery to shortcut you back to a previous area. Even entering doors has that very familiar iconic loading animation, and even just running up and down stairs feels and sounds very similar to how it works in the old RE games. Also, much like Resident Evil, this is a game that's clearly got speed running and repeat playthroughs in mind, with an end of run rank being given to the player, showing the total amount of deaths and saves they've had along the way, along with unlockable cheats and game modes only accessed after beating the game on certain difficulties. So if you're going to complain that the whole thing only takes you 5 hours to beat, well, yeah, on some level that might be a valid complaint, but then you've also missed the entire point of what the devs are going for here. I don't know what you're talking about. I also find the way the puppets constantly chatter to themselves similar to that weird banter you'd hear from the splices in Bioshock, and this kind of works in two ways. Firstly, to help set the environment up as just being this surreal, bizarre place. Lines to recite too. Let me show you. Uh, <clears throat> what the hell are you talking about? But then it's also a pretty clever way here to use diegetic noise to inform the player of nearby threats before you've even seen them. Kinda harkens back to old stealth games like Thief the Dark Project, where you'd hear guards coughing, whistling, and talking to themselves. 
And then even some of these environments feel like they could be taken right out of Rapture with this pseudo art deco theme they've got going on here in some of the corporate offices. And then the basement and the sewers having running water, pipes and all these slippery looking surfaces. <laughs> Either way though, each area is really distinguishable from the previous one, and you can look at a screenshot of any one of these and know exactly which part of the studio you're in. It goes a long way in helping the player remember where you're going and where you need to be, so you don't end up just running around in circles and seeing the same looking set pieces and rooms over and over. Plus it's just a really charming looking game with all these various puppets having a lot of visual appeal. And they do almost kind of make you forget that you're playing something made by two people because by and large the animations and the modeling are pretty decent. Yeah, just don't look at your character's hands. What is that? Oh my, no, 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 no. You mustn't do that. It was actually probably the best premise they could have gone with having these cartoonish looking life-size puppets as your main obstacle because in that regard they can be as goofy and wacky and unrealistically looking as they need to be. But even more importantly than all of that shit is that the game never crashed. Not once in like the 12 or so hours I played it. Which for something like this where saves are manual and limited and you're often having to play for long periods of time without any kind of respite, that is an absolute godsend. Now when it comes to the weapons, this is a pretty limited roster broken down into what's more or less a pistol, shotgun, chain gun and a grenade archetype. And overall the absolute definition of quality over quantity. Let's get writing. I'm not entirely sure what's supposed to be going on here with these guns, but it seems that you're more or less shooting enemies with giant letters instead of bullets. Okay. The first weapon you're probably going to find though is the wrench, which is a classic staple of most immersive sims, and it's popped up more in those kind of games than 0451 has as a door code. <laughs> This thing is more or less useless though, and you'd be better off trying to bash those puppets away with a bowl of mashed potatoes. Because the short range it's got combined with the insane reach those puppets have to grab onto you means you'll more likely take more hits than you'll dish out. You need a oh. Thankfully though, it won't take too long until you find the pistol, which is more or less a roller dex. Does it work? And this thing's gonna be the absolute workhorse that gets you through most of the game. Grenades, which are pretty hard to come by, are more or less like a full pack of Rolo Dex ammo, which can be thrown out and then explode seconds later in this shower of sparkly letters. Which is both like a visual and oral spectacle, seeing letters flying in all directions and watching those puppets ragdoll across the room. Soon after that you'll get the shotgun, what the game calls a novelist, and in typical survival horror fashion, shells are about as rare as Amber Heard fans. But this thing sure packs a mighty wallop, knocking down most puppets in a single blast. Then, if you're really good at secret hunting, as in really damn good, you can find the conclusion, which is more or less like a chain gun. This will bring them to a full stop. But I feel like the sheer amount of work it takes to find this thing, combined with how late in the story you can actually get it, does diminish how fun it could have been. All up, there's four difficulty modes. You've got normal, survival, and then veteran and unfriendly only being unlocked after beating the game first on survival mode. And it seems that the higher difficulties mess around with the numbers and the placements of puppets, along with reducing the amount of items you find in cabinets and lockers. To the point that those high difficulty modes really do start to feel a bit sadistic. Either way though, it's just a simple and effective lineup of guns to shoot these puppets with, then combat is pretty damn simple in that regard. When you enter a room, puppets are always non-hostile, just standing around and chattering away to themselves like a bunch of loonies, and a lot of the time, if you give these guys and gals a wide enough berth, you can completely avoid pissing them off in the first place. When you are seen though, they will absolutely not stop chasing you until you either knock them down with one of your weapons, or bugger off out of that room entirely, which resets their AI. The catch though is that even if you shoot a puppet and knock them down, they're really only going to be down until you leave the room because as soon as you come back in, they're back on their feet and ready to just come after you all over again. So to deal with this, you got to wrap them up in duct tape, which prevents this from happening. Is it duct tape? Tape. Yeah, it's, it's tape. The catch there though is that there's only so many bits of duct tape in the game and far too many enemies to possibly wrap everyone up. And again, to kind of sound like a broken record, even this is kind of similar to the mechanic of burning zombies in the RE remake so they didn't turn into crimson heads. It almost becomes a bit of a minigame in itself of trying to decide whether or not it's really worth it to use some of that tape on a downed puppet. 
there's definitely times when you're going to be moving through an area repeatedly, and even taking out one puppet for good is going to make traversing that room in the future a hell of a lot simpler. And you can really fuck yourself over late game here if you've used all of these up, and it really kind of harkens back to what survival horror is really all about, which is picking your battles. Having to micromanage all of these various little things to make sure you have an item when you need it the most, which in some cases can almost make or break a playthrough. And I gotta say, man, I absolutely love this kind of shit. I think coming back to an area over and over and knowing you made the right decision like an hour ago is just really rewarding. But on the other hand too, yeah, I can understand how that kind of mechanic is gonna piss a lot of people off. Hey. That's the kind of thing that makes survival horror what it is though. And if that's what you signed up for, well, then you're not gonna be disappointed. I'm just doing my job. On the subject of horror though, yeah, we should probably get into that or the lack thereof. And at times my friendly neighborhood really does feel like survival horror, just, you know, without the horror. Because despite this whole premise being pretty weird and a perfect setup for something much more sinister, it doesn't ever really get out of the realm of just being kind of goofy. These big googly-eyed puppets chasing after you, they aren't going to be tearing your jaw off or ripping open your head and shitting down your neck. In fact, more so, it seems like they're just trying to hug you to death over and over like those Japanese cartoons I've seen on the internet. <laughs> There is definitely a sense of tension when you're trying to run past them and not get grabbed, but getting attacked is more of a frustration out of losing those hard-earned health points, instead of it being the fear of life and death instilled into the player. And then even if you are killed, the game just kind of fades to black and you end up back at the nearest save point. It's kind of funny considering the absolutely brutal death animations we've seen in other horror games recently like in Dead Space, The Last of Us, Callisto Protocol and RE4, where you got to watch your character get brutally eviscerated and suffer the kind of physical trauma that could really only be dished out from some kind of an industrial machine. I mean, coming from that to now play My Friendly Neighborhood, where instead you just kind of seem to pass out after getting one bear hug too many, like it's really going from one extreme to another. As you'll eventually find out though, the non-violent nature of these puppets is kind of the point. And this isn't trying to be another one of those mascot horror games in the slightest, which is going to be an absolute relief for some people and obviously a disappointment to others. In fact, for these bigger, tougher puppets in each main area of the studio, you're more or less just befriending them by completing some sort of unwritten side quest, which then calms them down so they're not hostile towards the player anymore. Like for this one in particular, it turns the guy into this gentle giant, sitting across multiple chairs in a theater and gaping up at the screen with a goofy smile on his face. And you almost can't help but feel kind of sorry for the guy, you know, in spite of everything that he's done. Life can get you down sometimes, huh? I don't know, there's just something kind of sad about these lonely figures, these once popular childhood icons the time has since forgotten. Oh, sorry, sorry. And some of the sequences towards the end of the story just end up being surprisingly poignant and moving, with a real soul to the writing and the characters that I genuinely didn't expect. Seriously, Gordon, who hurt you? And I think on some level that everyone has their own version of My Friendly Neighborhood that they watched as a kid, which is why this thing resonates so well. On some level, man, almost everyone has to have that television series that they fondly remember watching when they were younger. For me, it was a show called The Ferals, a show about really mangy looking hand puppets beating the crap out of each other. And I still remember how that series slowly stagnated over time until they eventually took it off the air. <laughs> You've gotta be kidding. <laughs> So then, I can kind of see how the characters in My Friendly Neighborhood are in a similar situation. Only they become somehow sentient after being left in the shadows for so long, somehow magically coming back to life in a quest for relevance again. Kind of like Ray William Johnson. I mean, having said that though, like there are sequences and moments which are going to give you a good jump. Jeez, that gave me a scare! And there is a proper, full-on horror-based sequence towards the end, but if you thought this was going to be another Five Nights at Freddy's where serial killer-possessed puppets try to shove you into their large, gaping mouth holes combined with eardrum-popping distortion when they come up on the screen, well, this ain't it. <laughs> what it is though instead is a charming, challenging, soulful survival horror shooter, just often without the horror. Well, I'm going now. Combined with a whole bunch of side content to find and cheats and side modes to unlock. <laughs> Having said all of that though, let me pull my tongue out of the game's ass because there are still a few weaker aspects, just, you know, minor things here and there which feel a little less well thought out. 
For instance, one puzzle has you playing a board game against a seemingly lifeless puppet, where you outroll, outplay, and beat this guy to get to the end. Following some pretty strict rules, or else he pops to life and whacks you. Play by the rules! Oh. And yeah, look, it's not entirely bad once you know the rules, and it's easy enough in theory, but you often have to draw cards from a deck when you're playing it, and this is completely randomized. So if you draw the wrong card, which is something you really have no control over, well, then the game ends and you lose. I won! Oh. Ah. Now, for a first-time playthrough, this is perfectly tolerable, but for a game that seems to be aware that it's catering to that speedrunning demographic, this is an absolutely baffling design choice, and something like this is absolutely going to end a perfect speedrun if someone gets dealt a crappy hand. Literally. I won! And then consider too that you lose health points every time you get beaten or make a mistake, and on the hard difficulties and up, that becomes a real problem considering how precious your health points are. Another very Resident Evil inspired puzzle in the game has you mixing chemicals, and for this one you need to hold down a series of buttons for specific times to mix all these components together, and this one just seemed to be outright temperamental as to whether or not it was even going to work. At one point I even had my stopwatch going on my phone, and it still didn't seem to work properly. I even tried using one Mississippi, two Mississippi, and all that. And look, either I can't count for shit, which admittedly is also quite likely, or well, the puzzle is just too sensitive. Now, while things like this aren't huge issues, they're just the kind of things that stop a great game like My Friendly Neighborhood from being a truly great one. Should it matter in the end, though? Well, not really. And overall, I still enjoyed my time immensely. Okay, let's do this. I do feel like I say this in a lot of the videos I do for these kind of calmer, slower paced games, but the truth of it is, sometimes stuff like this, it really makes a nice change. Shoot! From dashing, sliding, and cutting people up with chainsaws in a cyberpunk-inspired dystopia. Now, that's not to insult or discount those kind of games either, but a product like My Friendly Neighborhood really shows you how you can truly have it each way and be enthralled by both. He's right, you know. My first run through on hard mode took me about five hours to get through. Then after that, beating it on very hard took me around two. And then there's still that unlockable, unfriendly mode to beat afterwards as well, which, as the dev told me, is basically next to impossible. So yeah. Have fun with that, bitch. You need a preference. Still though, look, I'd really have no dramas recommending this thing to anyone who's a fan of survival horror, even in the slightest. It might not offer up those clickbaity jump scares that help Twitch streamers pay their rent, but it's still a surprisingly character-filled, charming shooter that has a whole lot of soul. And again, for a game mostly made by two people, shockingly good stuff. Well, I'm going now. Right, so thanks for sticking around, and let me tell you about ExpressVPN. What's a VPN? Well, I'm so glad you asked. A VPN is something that's commonly promoted by YouTubers, and it's short for a virtual private network. Without using one of these, when you're connected to an unencrypted connection, you're putting all of your personal information at risk. Your emails, your passwords, but more importantly, your internet search history. Using a VPN, though, all of your data goes through an encrypted tunnel, which means that other people can't gain access to it. So, what ExpressVPN does is route this information through one of their many servers, with you also being able to choose from servers in over 90 countries. What's great about this when it comes to online gaming is that it doesn't affect your speed either. I've had this thing on constantly and had consistent connections when gaming. And with ExpressVPN, I mean the connection speeds are really solid across the board. It also comes in handy for other reasons as well, with streaming services like Netflix, the Raid, for instance, is one of the all-time best action movies ever made, but for some reason in Australia, this thing is unavailable. However, change your location to the UK and all that changes, and you too can then appreciate seeing countless bad guys getting kicked in the face. Not to mention, it also gave me access to a whole bunch of more anime series, not that I've watched that stuff. Now look, I'd never promote something that I don't use myself, but even then, you don't really have to look at that far to see people saying good things about this. It's got great reviews on sites like CNET and TechRadar, but more importantly, it's got great user reviews. I've been using ExpressVPN for over a year now without any issues. They also offer 24-7 customer support. So if you want to join the club and get three months for free, well, head on over to expressvpn.com forward slash gman to get started.